Good morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? Good. I hope you had a good, if you were here yesterday, a good first day at the show. I am Peter Gianetti, and I am the Director of Content, Editorial, and Education at the International Housewares Association. And some of you may know me as the Editor-in-Chief of Homepage News, which is the B2B trade publication uh, of the association. Um, I welcome you to the Inspired Home Show 2024. Uh, I mentioned that uh, I am the director of education and this is one of the favorite things I do when I'm uh, at the show is helping bring some insight into your world that's very actionable, that allows you to go back to the show floor, maybe see things in a little different perspective. Uh, beyond is kind of a theme of this year's keynote program. Uh, because all of our uh, experts, we had a session yesterday on the opportunity for the Hispanic market and how that is not just in front of you now, but it's going to continue to grow beyond today. We had a, a, a session in the morning from Trend Bible that, talked, that look, looked at trend not for tomorrow, but beyond tomorrow, because we need to keep looking forward in this business. Opportunity is not in the past, it's in, it's in how we move forward. Uh, today's uh, speaker, Joe Derachowski of Sircana, if you look at his session title, he's going to give us a little preview of 2024, the back half of 2024, but, but beyond. Uh, Lee Eisman later on this afternoon at 1 o'clock in this room from Pantone is going to take a look at the 2025 color palette for the home and housewares industry. And tomorrow, to cap off the theme of beyond, the leadership team with Beyond Inc., which was the former Overstock.com that acquired the Bed Bath & Beyond uh, uh, brand last year and relaunched it as Bed Bath & Beyond.com. They're going to be here not just to talk about what they've accomplished to date, but what will happen beyond today. So with that type of insight, we hope you can see things in this industry just a little differently. Uh, we're all focused on making sure we make our numbers. You've got budgets, uh, but sometimes the best way to make your numbers is to see a little bit into the future and understand how business is moving. And that's what this education program here is all about. I normally write notes when I go to introduce uh, a speaker, but with Joe Derachowski, I don't really need any notes. I first saw Joe speak, when was your first year in this home side, Joe? 2015, at a tabletop show in New York, he was speaking at a company's booth, and I hadn't met Joe before, but I went up to him afterward, and, and I explained to him, I've been covering this industry a long time. I've been dealing with NPD Group, uh, which is now Circana through their uh, merger with IRI a couple years back. Uh, I've been dealing with them since 1992. They really are the leader in the home space with regard to not just bringing uh, meaningful, deep data, but more so giving some analytical uh, perspective for that data. And what I told Joe after I met him is, Joe, this is really one of the first sessions I've seen in a long time where it wasn't just a dump of numbers. But you're going to get numbers. But believe me, you're going to see numbers. But it was really putting those numbers into context and letting, letting you know how they apply to your business. It's one thing to be able to have the technology to track and to capture the information it's miles above when you can take that complex data and uh, convert it and interpret it into actionable sound bites. And that's what Joe Derachowski does for the home industry. So with that, let me welcome Joe to the stage. We look forward to hearing what he has to say today. All right, thanks, Peter. There's 20 bucks for you in back there for that compliment. So thank you, guys. On a serious... I could use 25. 25, right. you got it. On a serious note, though, he does such a nice job in our industry of introducing and moderating, but does he ever get a chance to be thanked? I mean, is there anybody, that's right. Is there anybody more passionate about the industry to see it grow? He has a great history, because like he said, he's old. And on top of that though, but he's also so creative and looking for new ways and either way, I just thought did it. Thank you guys for showing up today. Uh, I know it's a very busy day, so I'm grateful to have your time. Um, I'm going to start with a quote. I used to have a colleague of mine who, he started all his presentations with this quote, and I thought for today, that's kind of where I want to begin. I love this quote. The purpose of research is to see what everybody else has seen, but to think what nobody else has thought. 
Now, it's founded by a Nobel Prize winner, vitamin C in the body founded. But what I like about this is research, it's not just giving the answers. It's very much of a creative tool. It is my sincerest hope that I share something today that creates a creative thought, a new way maybe to take your business. You have conversations with your colleagues while you're here at the show and when you get back to your offices. But my honest goal is a year from now, or two years from now, you stopped me somewhere out there and said, listen, I sat in this meeting. You said this that made me think of this, led to a conversation that took us down the way to help grow your business. So that's the goal of today. Second, from a logistics perspective, uh, there's going to be the last slide. It'll have a QR code so you can get a copy of all the slides. You just fill that out. You'll get a copy of the slides there. So on this way, just kind of look at the world and think of new ways that has never been thought. All right. Part of how I came up with this, if we look at the percent of new items to total items, we again saw a decline in 2023. Now I get in 2021, 2022 even, because there's a lot that we were managing as an industry, but when we look at 2023, I'm kind of surprised that it declined at this stage. And so it's critical, and that's the purpose of today's meeting, is to help inspire some innovation amongst all of us, because we really need it as an industry. Now second, take a look at that number. You're looking at 12% versus 19% in the higher teens for total general merchandise. It's one of those things where we should be in that higher teens. If we would have looked what we did pre-pandemic, that's where we would have been. So we really are craving innovation as an industry. Now with that, we do a thing called Future of Home, which is a forecast of over 150 some subcategories that goes across home comfort, it goes across floor care, it goes across kitchen electrics, and it goes across all housewares. And if we aggregate that together, we are forecasting a decline again in 2024. And one of the drivers is the lack of innovation. So I hope we prove this forecast wrong. That would be awesome. The second part is we start to see growth coming back in 2026, and I believe if we play our cards right, and I'll show you later some of the demographics, we should grow all the way to 2030. But we need innovation. That's the key right there for what we have. So we'll kind of go through this uh, as we proceed. One of the big drivers why we are where we are, picture from 2015 to 2019 where we had copper cookware, we had, uh, we had a portable beverage or have a run, we launched multi-cookers really taken off at that time. So we were always averaging about three to 6% growth. We did five times that in 2020, two times that in 2021. Uh, so in essence, we're kind of also in a bit of a pull forward, but that is opening doors for innovation. So this is a great time for innovation. So the focus of today, I wanna talk about what are some short-term opportunities to be thinking about for 24 and 25. Then some midterm opportunities when we think about basically up to 26 to 28. And then what are some opportunities from 28 beyond? All right, let's go. Anybody here with a teenage daughter? Right there, okay. So, and Christmas this year, was it toys? That's, that's exactly right. Face mask and all these beauty products. It's not toys. It wasn't apparel necessarily. It was, it was all this beauty stuff, right? Why? Well, part of it is, to give you a sense, is we track, as Peter said, we merge NPD and IRI merge. So we track like all CPG sales, but we also track all general merchandise sales. Within general merchandise, there is only one industry that grew from a unit's perspective, and it was beauty because of teenage girls and all of, all of that beauty that they have. Now, there's a lot to go into it. There's more mental well-being and other things at play, but one of the big drivers and the reason for us to be thinking about the innovation we need this year is in marketing. A lot of times, innovation is not just in products. It is how do we win mindshare? How do we compete against all those other things that they could spend their time on or spend their money on? And beauty has shown us the power of what social media and other marketing can do to drive a business. Even look within our industry. One of the top selling items for housewares last year growth was salad spitters. 
portable beverage ware. Those two were right at the top. You're starting to see things that social media is driving a lot of volume that people have. So I think what we want to be thinking to ourselves is what can we do from a marketing perspective to win Mindshare? Now, a little side note, uh, if you look at the red bar, that is the unit change versus pre-pandemic. There are only two industries unit-wise above pre-pandemic. Beauty was one. You guys, as well as myself, we were number two. So that's a good place to be. All right, so what are some things to think about? Who does concept testing? You guys know what a concept is? All right, some of you do. So, so a concept is an idea on a piece of paper. And it kind of consists of four different elements. And you can use it for branding. You can use it for positioning. Uh, you can use it for new products. It's a great way to do it. But one of the things that happens, the essence of it, is it starts out with a hook. An I wish, I hate, I love, I miss, I wish, I'm frustrated. Something that is driving it. And then the benefit solves the hook. Then the reason to believe is the technology behind it and then the price. Now our industry, a lot of times, we'll start with the, tech, with the technology, the reason to believe. It's got a 400 horsepower engine. It's got this color in it. It's got something here. I want us to start focusing for our marketing and product development to be thinking about what are the pains and frustrations that people have. So to give you an example of a concept, uh, I hate it that my toast when I cook it is uh, make toast that it comes out different. Uh, try new Joe's toaster that ensures that consistent quality throughout. And the reason is because I got this technology that makes sure it happens and it's 1099. Think about it that way. The I wish, the pains, I hope, I want you to think about it in the usage of the product. And sometimes you get that through reviews, but you might see something. We'll think of a, a, a blender. Uh, crushes ice so thin, so fine that it's a very consistency very quickly. But there's also an I wish I hate in the moment. In the morning, we start the morning trying to be calm. We want it quiet. We're kind of in a good mood. And then suddenly, <laughs> like it's so loud that it wakes up your two-year-old. You don't want that. So there's an I wish, I hate, I love, I miss, I hope, I, all that in the usage or in the occasion. That's what we want to speak to in our marketing. That's also what we want to try to develop products to solve, okay? So let's think about what are some of those things and behaviors that drove 2023, will drive 2024, and drive 2025 that we can leverage. One of them, if we look at eating trends, one of the categories that continues to grow from a unit four straight years is all the things related to specialty coffee, espresso makers, frothers, things of that nature. Now, if we can speak to that and solve some of the frustrations of making that or cleaning or whatever the case, or even from a marketing, you're gonna save at least a thousand bucks if you start to make these at home. Maybe that's a way to speak to it. Is there a marketing opportunity to convince the benefits of making it at home versus going out to a restaurant? There's so many other beverages. Water is still the number one beverage that we consume throughout the day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacking, all those occasions. Are there ways to add a little variety to that or make it easier? We know that tea consumption continues to grow. Tea makers, all that area is, is growing as we have. We know from an alcohol, beer is still number one, but the growing has been wine and the dark liquors. So if you're in housewares and you can leverage some of this, how can you market towards some of these behaviors that we have? We are doing a balanced diet. You know, we did from 2018 to 2020, it was a lot of keto and intermittent fasting, and they're still very popular. But we started to see this past year a growth of uh, smoothies returning. Rice cookers was one of the top growing appliances last year uh, from a unit's perspective. So things related to side dishes. And we know historically in tough economic times, we would start out with a steak, then we'd go to chicken, and we start to chop the chicken up and mix it with vegetables or rice in that area and things that lead to leftovers in that space. Well, again, that played out last year. So if there's ways we can market to that, or when you're walking the show floor and you start to see things related to this, that's what we're looking for. 
Um, we have become a heat and eat society. So one of the changes uh, over the past 20 years, you consistently see the number of frozen meals grow in our diet. So a way to freeze that. Now the other part is every single poor economic time, frozen meals gets an extra bump because it becomes the competitor for that Monday to Thursday restaurant meal that you might have. It's convenient and it kind of plays in that space. So the question is how can you help make frozen breakfasts, frozen lunches, frozen dinners, frozen snacks? What can you do to help make them better tasting, make them easier to serve, make them easier to heat, make them easier maybe to store? What can we do to help along that path? Leftovers. Uh, one dish meals used to be about 8% of all meals. Last year it was 16%. Why is that? Part, because we're able to look at this and say it becomes a, it becomes a leftover, which is a convenience play. It's one less thing that you think, what are we serving tonight? How do we figure this out? But the other part with it is it just, you could carry it away. It's something multiple. It could be used for lunch. So what are we doing to make, first of all, those products for one dish meals? It could be a slow cooker, it could be pizza. And then what are we doing to make the leftovers taste better? One of the primary mouthfeels that we have as consumers is we like crunchy. And especially when it starts hitting some of that leftover, if there's a way to play into that, we like that. Uh, portability. Because we are starting to get back out and about, we see portability being very, very important. So what can we do from a water perspective? What can we do from a... Uh, coffee perspective, or how about this? One of the changes that happened during the pandemic is we went from cold sandwiches and more of a cold lunch to much more of a hot. So how can we make that play out through this year? Maybe portable lunches that also are able to keep the heat with them. Entertaining, some of the categories that grew last year, chocolate fountains, fondue makers, ice cream makers, there's this specialness that people have, and part is the entertaining. And if you think about it, entertaining, it's not just your backyard porch, but you might be having people over for movies in the back area, in the yard. You might have them for your garages, those of us who live up north here during the winter time period. All these different changes for entertaining, there's so many I wish, I hate, and all those. Think of condiments, one of the fastest growing categories last year. The condiments that you would use outdoors, things that allow you to make it easier to apply outdoors and keep them while you're making meals outside a little bit safer in that different uh, uh, bottles that are in that space, there's so much opportunity for entertaining. So if you can leverage that in the next two years, either from a product and or a marketing perspective, I'd look at it. And the last thing, tailgating has returned. Camping and that is still an activity that picks up. So if we can market towards the, uh, those outdoor occasions and help solve those, and we see a lot of products that I saw yesterday going into space, I like those type of products right now. Okay, so in addition to innovation in marketing, there's an opportunity for innovation in merchandising. We have another product called Checkout. That it's a receipt harvesting. You track what the sales are on different receipts. And if I look at the number of items that we had this past year compared to the year before, and it was even down from the year prior to that, the number of items per order still goes down. A part of that is because the increase in online, how that plays out. But the other part of it is, are we really marketing to the moment? You know, if you go to try to buy a dieting book online, what's the recommendations that they give with you? Another dieting book. In essence saying, yeah, that's not gonna work. So try another one. It should maybe be having our products that are related to the needs of that diet. If it's a Mediterranean diet, maybe an oil and vinegar dispenser. If it's, a, if it's a keto or intermittent fasting, maybe coffee makers that play into it. But what is tied to that type of diet? That's where we need to build in from an online perspective. And then from an in-store, what can we do merchandising to provide the full solution for that life moment? If we think of entertaining, like I said, you've got, you've got tabletop you're gonna be using, you've got uh, gadgets that are gonna be part of this both in preparation, but also in the serving of the food, also in the additives that go with it. There's all these other variables that we could better market across the store, be it food or other general merchandise categories to make that life moment happen. Are we fully doing that to our ability? So I think there's an opportunity for merchandising. 
In addition to merchandising, there's an opportunity for innovation in the next two years from a pricing and promotion. There's not a better time. So here's which promotional day created the biggest market lift for single serve coffee makers. During the holidays, that last 13 weeks, I'm sorry, I didn't put the answer up there. It's none of these days. It is the sixth week. Week ending November 9th had the highest bump for that. Now I put this up here because last year we had more promotions than what we did in years past. And as a research nerd, that's a great time to do price and promotion studies. You got enough of a sample to start the digging into this. And I think it's incumbent on us to really sit there and say, which weeks are we getting the most incremental and which weeks are we doing the most subsidization that people are having? And is it the right time? It may not be as obvious as we think. I will say, just on a separate note with this, if I did air fryers, the answer is Black Friday. But I would be looking at this. How about this? Have you guys seen the article a week or two ago, about, or a, a couple months ago on Wendy's, trying dynamic pricing? What do you think about that? I see a lot of thumbs down and stuff. But the reality, it's been happening for a while, correct? Because there's always been happy hours. What is happy hour? It's, I got not enough, what, enough traffic, so I provide a discount. Or airlines, when prices up, they jack it up, right? So we've seen dynamic pricing in the model. If we did that concept, that means Black Friday should have the highest price. All right, don't kill me. I know it's not going to happen. Don't quote me on that. But the reality is, it does make us think, we just went through this pandemic. Is there a new innovation on when, timing of it, the depth, how it's done, what our strategy is? This is the year and next year are the two years that I would be really testing and understanding what do you want it to be? How does that fit your brand? Because that's going to set the table for the rest of the decade, right? So keep thinking about innovation also in this space as well. All right, so those are the short term. Now what are some of the midterm opportunities that we have? Anybody have one of these hot air stylers? Anybody? There you go. How do you like it? Love it. So hot air stylers up 211% versus pre-pandemic. Now what's the lesson? Never, ever underestimate how lazy we can be. Ever. Tonight, go back to your hotel, turn the TV on, throw the remote out the window. Don't, don't, don't do that. But throw it away. And I want to know how many times you get up and change a channel. You're just walking a few steps. Never, ever underestimate how lazy we can be. And so if there's an innovation that saves a step in a process, it usually gets rewarded. Like if we had a Mount Rushmore for the industry, what would it be? Big wave oven, maybe? Slow cooker? Single serve coffee? Recently, you probably put multi cookers and air fryers, right? What's the common theme? Save me time. A little bit of a convenience that it can play in, and we will be willing to pay four or 500 bucks. While everybody's talking about lowest price, you got people willing to pay money for this stuff. And because of that, the variable that I think is most important, and this is going to settle in, is the return to office. You know, if you think about this, is what you're seeing here is weekly off, office occupancy rate. The bottom line is this continues to go up. What's going to happen over the next two to three years? The hybrid life is probably not going to go away, but it's start, going to start to get solidified. So now, what does that mean? The beauty of it, it creates two new sets of I wish, I hate, and needs that the people have for us to solve. If we solve them, there's money to be there. Think about it. You're on a keto diet. So you're at home on a Monday. You probably make an omelet, do a protein shake for your mid-morning snack, have a salad or something in the afternoon, get your iced coffee at 3 p.m. or some little treat, sweet thing, and then you have dinner. Now well, the next day, you still making that omelet? You're doing hard-boiled eggs. 
What do you do with that protein? Drink for the mid-morning snack. So there's going to be a frustration and a desire because there's a habit we're going to want to create. But the question is, what are the solutions for that? And so this time is really a variable. What separates a trend from a fad? A trend is basically new, because we all like new, but it's new that either saves you money or saves you time. So I want us to be thinking about what are some of the ways that we can be doing this. And everything has a process. What's the step? Cleaning the house, there's a process. There's a step that goes with it. So what I want us to think about is what is the err that we can provide in any process. So think of consumption. You got planning, preparing, heating, serving, storing, cleaning up. Can we make it better, faster, cheaper, healthier, safer, some sort of err over the existing behavior? Let's go through some opportunities here. We talked about caffeine and coffee. What can we do to make it better and easier to provide an err for making, let's say, a latte or a cappuccino? Um, how about for a smoothie? What's the err that we could provide there? Cereal, what can you do so the kids aren't spilling it in the morning when they're having it? Eggs, boy, there's a lot of opportunity there to solve, right? Um, oatmeal, so the consistency is there that the consumer may have. What are the I wish, I hates that are in this space that we go with it, heat and eat. How can we get, you wanna make mom's life? How do we get the kids to cook? And especially in the morning where things are just crazy for mom, right? Like she's managing the whole world, trying to get the kids ready, the school, all the things. What can we do? Is there a way that we can teach kids to heat and feel comfortable? And part of it is gonna be that mom feels comfortable and safe with it. Is there an innovation from a product that would allow us to do that? If we look at lunch, we talked about some of the portable heat-related things that are starting to play in this space. Uh, Mid-afternoon snack, 3 p.m. You're going to start, I promise you, starting today, every day at 3 o'clock, you're going to go, yeah, he's right. You always get a sweet taste. Could be a candy, but a lot of times what happens is we start getting the iced coffee at that space. What are we doing, or a macchiato? What are we doing to help fill that opportunity, whether at home or when they're in the office? And then with dinner, what are we doing for the main dish? How many innovations do we have for the side dish? We had one a couple years ago with air fryer starting. At the time, 95% of it was for fries, which is a side dish. Now we got the rice cooker. How many things are really designed to help maybe make vegetables taste better? or come out? What do we do for these side dishes? Or how about the rhythm of the week? Tell me if this is you. Monday, most consumers, if, from our food data, would say we want to be healthy. Tuesday, we choose what are the kids going to eat. Wednesday, it kind of goes across the board. Thursday's leftovers. Friday's pizza, take home. Saturday could be entertaining and Sunday's the family meal. Is there a better way to manage the rhythm? Could smart be in a way? How do you help mom on Sunday going, here's gonna be the rhythm of your week this way? And we got the products to help walk you along that path. Another innovation, we talked a little bit about marketing, but just overall, all along the path to purchase. Imagine, if we're trying to cook, at the beginning of the pandemic, there's a huge growth in 45-minute meals. So we got involved. Think of all the ingredients that happened during this lockdown that the retailers did that were just brilliant to make the path to purchase better. We know that there's virtual and augmented reality. We know that there's buy online, pick up in store, some of those things. We know that uh, there's contactless payment that people are having. I'm sure your mother or grandmother is, knows what a QR code is, and that's what they use at the restaurant to get the menu, right? There's so much new ingredients to the path to purchase. Is there a different way to look at those ingredients, a different way to mix them up? Is there a way to do it online? Is there a better way to do it, especially in store? 
And I think there's a huge innovation opportunity over the next four or five years that's going to play in this space. It could be what your teenage daughter knows, her path to purchase as she sees it on TikTok or Instagram. She does her research, which is amazing how much they know. She gets you to buy it, right? How is that going to change? But I bet your mom has a different one. How is this path changing, and what is the innovation that we can do to make it easier, better, faster, safer, healthier, all in that space? All right, so what are some of the long-term opportunities? That's 2015 to, or 16 to 18. Long-term, right here. If you want to know what the next trend is, this is the answer. Because if you think about it, a trend it's a change in behavior times a change in the number of bodies, fair? And what this is, that second part of that equation, it's the change in the number of bodies. It comes from the US Census, and it's saying between this decade, where mathematically is the incremental number of bodies? And it's important for our industry, it's part of the reason why we should continue to grow to 2030, because if we look at some of these big life moments, you're a freshman on campus, a little bit down, but off campus up, although freshman this year will be up. Uh, your first marriage historically was around 29, a little older for men, a little younger for women, but all in all 29, it's bumped up a little bit, but it was settled in that space. Your average first home used to be 32, 33, up to 36 right now with the interest rates, but it'll probably come back down as we go through this, but mathematically that's in our space. Once you move into a house, your kids are in school, you start to entertain much more once they get into elementary school. And now what you're having there is you start doing remodels, kitchen, bathrooms, in those areas. Great opportunity for us to sell. Then we start hitting into empty nester stage. You spend four or five years traveling, but then you make a decision, upsize, downsize, remodel, or buy a second place. Whatever those answer, it's very good news for us. And then you retire, about a third of the people move more than 300 miles away. Again, a great opportunity for us. So if you can think about how to tie into those life moments, so like if somebody's knocking down a wall doing a kitchen remodel, you've already got the coffee maker, the toaster oven, and the microwave being marketed to them early in this process. What about from an eating perspective? Any first time moms right now? with the new little one? Okay, tell me if I'm correct. Right now, how old? Two. And at two years old, uh, are you, it's okay, humble brag. Eating, bro eating broccoli or kale, right? Spinach, yeah. Sweet potatoes, absolutely, like that's awesome. I have bad news for you. At age five, they're gonna get texture issues. And guess what? You're going to get in a fight. Because you're going to be going, no, what about the kale and the broccoli and the spinach? And no, I want that. And at some point, that battle continues. So convenience is going to pick up part of the growing population. Then when you start hitting uh, middle school and elementary school, you're an Uber driver. You're driving to this sporting event, your spouse going to that sporting event. So now when you cook dinner, how do you make it so everybody gets it done to what their liking is, knowing how mobile? And then when the kids start driving on their own, well, now everybody's eating at different times. How do you keep the food warm? If you just made a dish for the family and you're all not sitting around the table, how do you keep it warm? Is there an innovation opportunity there? Then you go off and become a restaurant consumer in that period. But once you start hitting your 30s, and you buy that first home with your child, you start really developing your cooking repertoire. Once you do that, you really start to figure out what you want, how to cook it, how to prepare it. You are totally open to new products. Then suddenly, 55 plus, more than 60% of people have a medical issue. Well, if you do, you start to act on health. That means more fruits, more vegetables, exercise, more homemade, less processed foods. All of those are great for our industry. And then what about, you got multi-generational homes at some point that'll be playing into this space. That's a whole new set of needs. So the I wish, I hate, I love, I miss, and I want 
is different by each generation. What are you solving for? How are you marketing it? This is where the answer is for the future. There is no right answer. Just do it with a purpose. And how do you build into that? Okay? The other thing, smart. I know we went through it a little bit ago, but we're still ripe for smart. But if you remember, we started smart by going, hey, look, I got an app. I remember being at a conference in Germany where they, I got a smart iron. I can use a code to tell me how long it ran. Where's the I wish I hate in that? Right? Uh, I got a, how much water, I can flip it faster. So now we're moving it from being a benefit to being what it should be, a reason to believe that solves the pain and frustration. And we are very much ripe at this stage. We've got some out there, but it's not complete. I'll tell you robotic vacuums, 99% or 98%, I'll round down, 98% have Bluetooth connectivity. So smart is coming, we just gotta figure out. And part of it is the major appliance companies have now the ability to track all the items in your refrigerator and provide guided recommendations on what to eat. So again, picture that group about to become first-time homeowners, first-time developing their cooking repertoire. This could be a vehicle that does it. Now the problem is, to do that, you need appliances, small appliances, you need uh, housewares, you need to be able to track dry goods, so things not in the refrigerator, all these other things, so we're, we're on the precipice of this. We just have to bring that stuff together, but it's gonna happen. Now, why is that important? In that chart that we just had a second ago, look at that group in the 25 to 29. That's your Gen Zers. Five years, they're gonna be in that prime home buying space. And then they're gonna to start to be in the prime developing cooking repertoire. And unlike any other generation at that stage, because of the pandemic, they had to learn to cook a little bit. Again, not chefs, but much more familiar with the kitchen than any other generation. And their tastes are much more eclectic. So the amount of involvement in meals could be there if we can inspire, but also innovate on products to make those foods easier. So there's a great opportunity as we do that. All right, finally, um, doing business in Mexico here. Boy, of all the countries that we go through, you see in the US, Canada, a lot of other places in Latin America, all those areas are seeing a decline, but Mexico is growing. And a big part of it is because of the diversification of manufacturing. So they've got jobs. And the jobs they have could, they're having new people come in, but also, it's maybe going to a different city, which is causing movement. And all of that is great for us. So one of the things, both long and I'd also say short term, is I'd dial up some presence in Mexico. There's money to be made there. Now with that, I'm gonna do a plug. There's Pam and Renee right over here. Two of my colleagues are doing a presentation tomorrow morning uh, at 9 a.m. right next door here. Uh, they're gonna compare Mexico and Canada, the sales, also compare it to the US, so it's an awesome presentation, so go attend that tomorrow. But long story short, in summary of today, we need innovation. We gotta make 24 see an increase in the number of new items. We need innovation, not just in products, but in marketing and along the path to purchase. Now I started with a quote, I'm gonna end with a quote. I talked to, we got a group that does new product forecasting and I told them about presenting here. And they, they showed me this chart and I thought, well, this is probably what everybody knows, but it still is a nice checklist. It's a nice reminder of what they see as always being the successful new products. Has the right attributes consumers are looking for, which are related to, I wish I hate. They are offered at a right price. They, have the correct positioning, again, towards the frustrations and pains and wishes that the consumer has. They're packaged and shelved in the right way, have the appropriate media tied to them, and they know their target audience. And with that, if you scan the code, you'll get a copy, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Folks, stick around. We're going to give you a chance to ask a few questions. 
But I'm going to start with one, and it surrounds this whole issue of new products. I've written in homepage news that we're at this inflection point where, when it comes to new products. There were legitimate reasons that retailers may not have invested in neither suppliers during the pandemic. You were selling anything you had. Why invest in something new if you can sell out of everything you have? Then supply chain disruption made it difficult to get those new products to the stores. Uh, so why should I invest in something I'm not going to be able to get to you? And then you know economic inflation, all those variables. I like to believe that we're past those very legitimate reasons that have sort of slowed the new product development cycle. I hear from retailers, I imagine you hear from retailers, they need new products. I hear from manufacturers, we're introducing new products, but I also hear from manufacturers, retailers say they, they want new products, but they're really not buying new products. How do we kind of close that gap, reconcile that problem? Well, I, first of all, you described the situation very, very well, because what we went through in 2020 through 2023, what a crazy time period for both manufacturers and retailers. So part of it is just, the good news is retailers want to grow the category, they want to grow their area, and they want to grow their business. That's a good starting point. Now there is a little bit of a risk aversion. They don't want to have excess inventory, excess things, so there's understanding. Part of the ways to help alleviate that, and I recognize I'm a research nerd, so I apologize that I pull this out, but that concept testing or product for, that type of thing it helps provide confidence as to what the favorability is, what the competition, what might be coming off the shelf, uh, and my price position right, who to target, like just helps alleviate some of that risk. So I'm a big fan of that. But I think the underlying current of needing to grow, and as we get further and further from all those tough logistical challenges that you talked about, I think we're going to see more and more new products. That's why you got to. And the ability to, to vet a product yes. is considerably, I'm not going to call it easy now, but there are so many more options available to have direct contact uh, with the customer, with the consumer, I should yes. say. So uh, let's open it up to questions out here. Hold on. Anyone, anyone, anyone? Oh, there's got to be someone who wants to ask Joe a question. Well, you're going to make me ask him another question then. So, Joe, you and I have talked. Okay. Uh, unusual circumstances with regard to product replacement created by the surge of the pandemic. And tell us where product replacement now might factor into the equation of growing this business, bringing more new products into this business. Well, I, I'll give you a hint. Since, uh, since January 27th, stick vacuums have been up almost double digits. 8 to 12% every single week in that period. Now why? Well, part, they're hitting some of that replacement cycle, but they're also tremendously discounted and promoted at this time as they're getting, so it's hitting kind of two areas, but we're seeing huge growth, both units and dollars, in this space because of, in large part, the right timing of replacements. I think we're gonna hit it, what we have in our forecast, the kitchen electrics, uh, and the home environment, a lot of those areas, you're going to start to see that more 25 to 28 hitting some of the prime replacement phases for those. Cookware is going to start a little bit earlier. I suspect that's going to happen Q4 this year as well as in 2025. But the benefit, what we can learn from stick vacuums is if you can time your pro promotion correctly at those same times, you might be able to speed that cycle up. The underlying benefit that we have is by being more home-centric, we are using these products much more than ever before. Um, and so there's a great opportunity. And on top of that, you kind of make me think is with stick vacuums, there's an insight there. We, the hybrid life has changed the terminology of convenience and how we define it. Heading into it, using this as an example, robotic vacuums were super hot heading into the pandemic. And they still are. They're still well above pre-pandemic levels. But what happened is now during the pandemic, and because the innovation in stick vacuums, the innovation in design, the innovation in storage and organization, people are now saying, you know, it's just easier to grab this sometimes. So it's redefined convenience from what it was pre-pandemic because of the needs on the days you go to the office versus days you don't. That is also impacting how we make our breakfasts, our lunches, our dinners, how we clean the house, how we, uh, the home improvement projects we do, how we entertain, all that stuff is in flux. That's why that time chart is one of the things you gotta keep monitoring because that really is gonna define the needs 
for the rest of the decade. It's funny, when you, uh, I thought of something when you mentioned Gen Z being you know, the 25 to 29 year olds. I think we're all guilty of thinking of generations at the age with which, at which they started. And I remember learning, thinking about it, millennials are going to be 50 soon, some of them, some of the early millennials. Uh, their needs change. Uh, they are rooted, their rooted values don't necessarily change, but their, their needs change. I just, thought, I just thought that was an interesting. Uh, be surprised, folks, when you hear things, because surprise is the biggest motivator. When you didn't know something, that's an opportunity to, take, to, to jump onto something. And, and I think what, what Joe and is able to do is help find those, those surprising moments that sort of trans, translate into marketing opportunity. And the other thing Joe tells us is we often get stuck thinking innovation is just a, a, a product advancement. Uh, you can have terrific marketing innovation without terrific product advancement and have tremendous amount of success if you think about how, how those products are gonna go to work. One last shot. Anybody for a question? Ah, thank you. Any products? Wait, hold on while we get you a, a microphone so everyone in the audience can hear you. Thank you. If you guys got a question on a category or something, happy to give you a perspective on what that looks like for the next few years. Thank you. Um, are you seeing or what insights are you seeing for renters versus homeowners and products that make them feel like this is more of a lasting place even though it's a temporary stay? Are you seeing that trending upwards in terms of products that can resonate with renters? Yeah, well, and, and it's more most importantly, it's opening. You're, you're entering some of the, it's still in the early phases of even payment plans, like how is this gonna play out? And, you, and I suspect that student loans really start to hit harder and harder to the consumer's wallet, that they might start looking for unique ways to help them do it. And a lot of times that's gonna be that early stage renter. Um, but I think one of the things you're hitting on is the size, though, and I think that's where we get in. Sometimes we forget about we've got a lot of single households, both pre- and post-kids and, and post-home buying, and then you're going to have the multi-generationals. And all those sizes just have different needs and different size capacity just because the number of foods you cook are different. So whether it's renting or homeowning, it's really a lot of it is driven by am I a one- or two-person household? That drives a lot of your eating behavior, and it's tough to cook in that. So there's huge opportunity, I think, to continue to market towards that. As we saw that little census area, you saw some of the growth that is happening in that 20, 20 to 4 area. That's going to be some of your prime renters. I think there's an opportunity in that space. Anyone else? In the back, hang on a second while we get you a mic. Uh, thank you. I was really struck by the return to work kind of split and almost making um, people's days uh, on different days of the week, they need different things. And that made me think of almost two kitchens uh, diverging in our home or two spaces and different needs on those different days. Do you feel like the products that um, consumers are going to need are going to be more different products or multifunctional products for those different days, for those different needs? Is there a, we're on that spectrum. Do people want a nice pan for the day that they're staying at home versus a product that solves the, the time problem? I think if they can use the product as many times, like the goal of all products should be, I want to be used from sun up to sundown. And I want to be used from Monday to Sunday. Like that's the goal and throughout the year. And so if you can be, we'll call it multifunctional, and achieve that, knowing we will not compromise on taste. We will not compromise on taste. If I can accomplish that or the essence of it, I'm going to love it. But if I can't, then I'm going to satisfy the needs because I'm going to be thinking more, i got to get to the office right now. i got a time crunch. That convenience lever is going to dial up on those days that you go into the office. And so because of that, if I have to buy something special for it, I'll do it. So it really gets into, it's going to start with the need. If they can use multifunctional, they will recognize we won't give up on quality of the end use of that product. And if I can't, then yes, I'll find something special. Good question. What else? Right here, hold on a moment. We'll take one more after that if there's another. So this, this, this one and another one. Um, where do you see the future of impulse purchases going? Do you see that continuing to rise? Well, seeing the number of attachment rates 
that's where I'm kind of getting a little worried about that. Like, what are we doing different to inspire? Uh, part online, but the other part is what are we doing different in store? Like, we can't rest on the laurels that we had pre-pandemic. Oh, I got an end cap, and here you go. What can we do more? Like, that's what we should be asking. What are we doing? We're trying to inspire the consumer, and a lot of times they're going to need to first be inspired what it is. They're going to need to understand it, a little bit of education. Then they're going to need a little bit of confidence that I'm not making a mistake here, right? And then being able to fulfill the rest of the path to purchase. That's where I think some of the innovation will start your, to your, grow. Your data shows fewer items, fewer items per purchase, right? right? So that right. sort of suggests impulse buying is, yes. is down. But that downward movement actually represents a new starting point to try to build that upward yes. momentum and to, to Joe's point, creating that impulse uh, traction at the store level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one more, anyone else? Oh, right next door, hold on a second. What categories are we seeing continued growth in? Um, so for example, um, I know that people are reaching milestones later in life. Um, people are not having as many kids as they might have done previously. So are we seeing a potential shift in um, like single families homes? Is it like key purchasing power? Are we seeing um, like singles or people who live with roommates later on in life? Or you know, what category of person is, has a lot of purchasing power in the future? Well, I would say for the decade, following that chart is you're going to see those in the family forming years that's the biggest chunk as well as those in the later retirement years uh, and that also is an opportunity because once you start getting plus 70 years old in that area there are going to be some people that just eat less but they need more and so maybe it's not crunchy now it's gonna be a little more chewy or a little bit different forms and stuff so there's steam cooking might be a benefit as an example so i think we want to be thinking about the needs of each of those groups. In terms of the categories, you know, I'll just say in the short term right now, what really grew this past year from a kitchen electrics, will, which will probably continue again in 25 or 24 and 25 is gonna be things, one dish meal, so slow cookers did very well, rice cookers, your smoothie makers, so single serve and traditional blenders and things related to eggs. Those did very, very well this past year. From a housewares, it was all related to serving gadgets, portable beverage where food storage, traditional food storage, also did very, very well at that time period. From the major appliances, it was about freezers because needing freezer space and ice makers because of the increased beverage consumption that we're having. Uh, textiles, it was a lot of replacement for bath-related stuff. There's a lot of bathroom remodels happening at this stage. Home improvement, that's really driven by storage and organization. And that's a big thing too, I should say. Think about it, pre-pandemic, we all wanted to be a minimalist, right? We wanted it big open kitchen and island, but nothing on it, nothing, nothing, right? And then you would see fans go from this big to these narrow fans. We'd see window shades go from that to, to or, uh, uh, big, big window uh, garments going into having nothing on your windows. So we just change what we're doing and we wanna be minimalist. And then here we are, we jump five, six times in 2020, what we normally do, and two times in 2020, one, we bought all this stuff. And so one of the areas that continues to grow both in home improvement and as well as kitchen storage and cleaning, those things that help you stay organized is important. So with your product, if there's a way to help save in that space, that's a very good innovation to leverage right now. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Joe. I'm sure Joe can stick around for a few minutes if anyone wants to chat with him. Uh, we wish Success on the trade show. If you want to join us again this afternoon, 1 o'clock, Lee Eisman from Pantone. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.